30 and we have lots of folks uh, signed into the call. Um, I just want to say hello. I am Veronica Cruz Mercado and I am one of the writers for This is Tucson. And today we are hosting a joint event with uh, the members of This is Tucson and the members of the Tucson Museum of Art. So thank you everyone um, for being part of tonight's event and joining us today. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with This is Tucson, we are a digital platform run by five women, um, many of whom are also on the call today as well. Um, we write stories and bring you information um, that connects you to the Tucson community, is helpful to your daily life, and helps you discover all, all of the things to love about Tucson, like the Tucson Museum of Art. Um, you can read our stories on thisistucson.com. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at This Is Tucson. We also have a free um, app that you can download to your phone so you never miss a story that we write. And we started a membership program in mid-March, also known as the time when everything changed in our lives. Um, so our members help to support us financially and support all of the work that we do. So we are so grateful to all of our members um, who are joining us today. If you're not a member but are interested in learning about that, you can check us out at thisistucson.com. Um, I know that we also have a really strong presence today from Tucson Museum of Art members. Um, and we're gonna hear a lot more about um, the exciting things that are happening at the museum in just a minute. Um, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes today. Um, since we do have such a large group, we have about 55 people today and counting. Um, We're going to ask that everybody remain muted. Um, and we also have just automatically muted you as well. Um, but we do want to encourage interaction. So I will be asking a few questions of our museum experts. They will be sharing a ton of amazing information with us, but we also want to be able to answer some of the questions that you have as we move through the event. So you can do that by submitting um, your questions in the chat. So at the bottom of your menu of your Zoom screen, you'll see the little chat icon. If you click on that, you'll be able to type in your messages. I will see them and um, ask them on, on your behalf. Um, we're going to do a few different things today. We'll see a couple of different spaces in the gallery, and then we're going to end with an interactive activity, which our museum experts will tell us more about. Um, so I am so excited to welcome our experts from TMA. Uh, today we are joined by Mariana Pegno, who is the Curator of Community Engagement and Christine Brinza, the museum's senior curator and Glasser Curator of Art of the American West. Thank you so much, Christine and Mariana. Um, I know that there has been so much happening at the museum in recent weeks, even though your doors have been closed to the public. Um, so I would love to hear from you if you'd like to share with us kind of what some of the exciting things are that have been happening in this space, what people can look forward to. And most importantly, I think the question that's on everyone's mind right now is when can we expect the museum to reopen? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for having us uh, this evening. We're really excited to be doing this live event with This is Tucson. It's an incredible opportunity for us to kind of practice also with you and join forces. Uh, my opinion is collaboration is always a little better. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm Mariana Pegno. Uh, so the million dollar question, and I know I can say this because our CEO newsletter just went out announcing it officially, um, but we are, planning to reopen to the public July 30th. So now you've heard it here and my big mouth has announced it. Um, <laughs> but we're really Breaking looking news. forward to that. Uh, for so many reasons, Southwest Rising, our exhibition that's on view is extended. Um, so it's an opportunity to revisit that. But the new Kasser family wing, which is 6,000 square feet of new gallery space showcasing 3,000 plus years of Latin American art and history will also open simultaneously. Um, and Christine, maybe you want to talk about a little of, of the facelifts and changes out in the gallery. Oh, yes. So while the museum is quiet, it's the perfect opportunity 
for us to do a little bit of refreshing. So um, in our permanent collection area on the lower level um, and also on our upper level where the contemporary gallery is, we have some new things that we are putting out that maybe you haven't seen at all or maybe you haven't for a while. So we're bringing out some old friends too. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. It's happening. We even had a few installs today. So <laughs> what can I say? And the This is Tucson group got to watch us install a couple of pieces while we were test running our, our technology. So um, we're excited about those changes and really excited to welcome visitors back to the museum. Um, there's new procedures and protocols and those are all on our website and we're encouraging online ticketing. Um, so if you're not a member, become a member because members get preview access and preview to tickets. Um, but come check us out soon. Our AC is on, so we're a nice break <laughs> from the heat. And that art always makes me feel better during all these crazy times, so. It's a really good reprieve, I think. Yeah. Come to the museum, look at some art, maybe contemplate your life a little bit, you know. Or don't in the moment. Yeah, I yeah. Look yeah. at this so I don't have to think about it. Yeah, have a little <laughs> bit of release or peace or tranquility. Whatever need the museum can offer it. Yeah. Well, that's really exciting. I think we're all looking forward to that. Um, what is our first stop today, Mariana? So we are right now standing in our Indigenous Arts Gallery. Um, Christine is going to give an, us an intro to this space. Um, we're going to talk about it maybe for like 10 minutes. If you guys have questions, please feel free to chime in in that chat um, and then we can pivot to those. Um, so yeah, let's take so it away. Where we are standing right now, of course at social distance, um, is the Indigenous Arts Gallery on the lower level of our main building. And it highlights the collection of arts from um, the Indigenous peoples across the United States. It mostly is focused on Southwest, but we do have work that um, is from across the country, from California to, um, East Coast. Um, and the different media that we have here, as you can see behind me, we have textiles, we have sculpture, we have painting, but we also, um, which I hope you'll see in a moment, we have pottery, we also have basketry. It's a wide range of artwork that we have in this collection. And it's a long span of time that we have in this collection. The oldest piece we have is from 1100. And so can you imagine having something that old? Yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? Um, through today. So we have contemporary artists who are creating work that is you know, bringing relevance and conversation to the past and the present. So it's a good collection. It is. I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> Christine is our Christine. Care caretaker of this collection, so <laughs> yeah. she, you know, gets to, to spend plenty of time with it. That's right. Yeah. Christine, um, do the pieces in this particular gallery and collection change regularly, or is everything there on permanent display? That's a great question. So many of the pieces we have in this collection are sensitive to light. And so we have a requirement um, for conservation reasons that at least every year we switch out pieces that are organic. So textiles or baskets that we will put back in the vault so that it can rest in the dark. So not everything stays up all the time. You may see some things longer than others, but we do kind of keep an eye on things. I'm gonna pivot real fast. You That's guys can get a little bit of a view of some of our textiles on the opposite wall over here. So what Christine was talking about were these kinds of works that are organic materials will change out annually. Right. Or sooner if we need. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. We will pivot Ooh, back. Make you dizzy, sorry. I know, sorry guys. It's good enough. Um, so Christine and I have been working together really closely, I'd say since what, like 2013 a lot. Um, and we have a lot of conversations about communities and perspectives in relation to artwork. Um, so we've started this thing called Community Voices 
table, which you guys will help us create a little leader in the program. Um, but also kind of talking about works in our collection and how they talk to each other. So I'm going to change the screen unless there's another question. Any other questions? Um, I do have another question, but I would like to, to see. Um, I, just, I just was curious, um, in general, as curators, um, if you could speak just a little bit about the process um, when you're selecting works to be part of a collection, um, in this case, this particular collection, you know, what stories are you looking to tell with the different pieces that are on display? Sure. So, you know, we could have an entire other part Zoom two program about yeah. <laughs> how we put together our collections and how we put together exhibitions because it's kind of complicated. Um, but if I were to give you the Cliffs notes, maybe. <laughs> Um, the Tucson Museum of Art um, acquires works um, that fit in with the um, needs of the community, the um, aesthetics of the work of art itself. There are lots of reasons that we take into consideration. And when we're putting a show together, for example, like this exhibition, you kind of hit, hit it exactly when you said stories, because these works of art each tell a story. And especially with the Indigenous Arts Collection, there are many prominent stories that need to be told. We want everything to have its time to shine. And so when we're putting a show together, we're looking at how these stories can come out and how each artwork works with the other one. So we I'm look share at this one. Okay, she's going to share um, a specific story. A specific you can story. Enlighten us about. And how a lot of the time I look for these conversations that can be made or juxtapositions between artworks. And so it, it becomes more um, in depth for people to explore. You may not see it on the surface, but if you take a moment to look, then you might discover something. So we have two works here and they're actually side by side in our gallery, um, but because of the perspective and distance, we wanted to put them on a screen for you to look at. Um, we have one work by Fritz Scholder, which is a print as well as um, a ceramic piece by Monica Silva. And why did you put those side by side, Christine? Well, um, so Fritz Scholder was um, a, Lucenio, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Indian. And he was looking at modern and contemporary works of art. You know, he was during that time where Andy Warhol and all these major artists were coming about. And so he participated in that whole art world, let's put it that way. And so he was looking at how to integrate modern art with native art. And so this print here of the tomato soup in the bowl, <laughs> I put next to this Monica Sil Silva dough bowl because they're both related to um, Kiva pottery. And so I'm looking at the contemporary or um, the more uh, pop art related art, and then I'm putting it in conversation with an original piece. So the tomato soup reference actually goes back to Andy Warhol and how, if any of you know anything about him, he's known for his tomato soup cans, um, these, these paintings that he did. And so it's kind of like a homage to that. So it's kind of fun, a little tongue in cheek. So you're looking at the more historic and the contemporary put together. So that's just one of those things. I could go on and on as you can tell. Well, I think that this is a good opportunity for us. We're going to move to our um, second stop on our tour and then we can talk about a little bit about what community-based curation looks like. Um, and this is sort of the role that I play more. I'm, I, I, st I go between kind of the museum and different communities that we're trying to work with. Um, and the place where clouds is formed, are formed is an example of that process. So we're gonna move um, and you guys are gonna get to see a little tour of the gallery space as we do this.
Are there any other questions? Yeah, as we move, we can answer questions. Yeah, this is a good time. If anyone has any questions to send in the chat um, based on what Christine just shared or um, anything that you're seeing as we move through the exhibit. Mm -hmm. I have um, so many questions about community-based curation, Mariana. <laughs> Perfect. So we will talk about that in one second. Yep. All right. So we had mapped out where we're stopping. So we have a plan. I'm going to move this a little. And we're going to come here now. I love this personal tour. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so we are now standing in this special project or an intervention in our Indigenous Arts Gallery called The Place Where Clouds Are Formed. Um, and for us, this was brought to our attention by a collaborator we were working with, Ophelia Zapeta. Um, and she recommended that as we were looking to work more closely with Tona Atam communities, that this, might, this project might be a good fit. And so we started working with her over a year ago now. Yep. Um, and we were working with her on an exhibition Christine was curating called The Western Slime. Yes. And we were hoping that these two exhibitions were going to open together. They did not. That's okay, though. <laughs> it worked out better, I think. It did work out nicely. Um, and the reason they didn't work on time, happen on time, was we wanted to make sure we had community buy-in and input in the curatorial process and had loans from certain artists that the three collaborators on this project, Martin Zakari, um, Gareth Smith, and Ophelia Zapeta had worked with. So you can see front and center right here is a, is a pottery by Ruben Naranjo. And then in the back, we also have photographs and poetry by Amber Ortega. So we have two extra perspectives in this, in addition to photographs, poetry. Um, yeah. Yes. And Ophelia Zepeda is um, a linguist of uh, Tohono O'odham, and she's a professor at the University of Arizona, just to give you a little background on her. And so this exhibit is based on her collection of poetry, um, Where the Clouds Are Formed. Mm -hmm. And I am just curious to know, can you share, I know the museum came into this um, after the collaborators had already been um, working together on this project, but can you share a bit more about um, how these pieces all work together and what what they really um, demonstrate about um, this place in the community and, and the Otham community in general? Yeah. So as the institution at 140 North Main, right, our main address here, we are on Otham land. Um, and I say Otham land because prior to the Gadsden purchase in 1853 um, and even before that in 1848 with the treaty, the Guadalupe Treaty, the Otham community would have kind of interacted. There are four, right, separate tribes that are in the Phoenix area and then in Tucson, the Otham community. Um, so we are on Don Otham land, we are on Otham land. And that was something we felt really strongly about telling that story and looking at those things. So we started to develop a land acknowledgement statement working with different um, cultural committees through the Tona Atham community, as well as different artists and experts. So and this, oh, go for it. We made a commitment to having the land acknowledgement in our galleries, on our website. Mm -hmm. Um, in our e-news. In our e-news. You can see it here, right? Maybe, Very tiny up there. Maybe behind you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> behind me. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that it is something that we are committed to doing. And so this project, specifically the Place Where Clouds Are Formed, started in 2018 with the support of the Magnum Foundation. Um, the three collaborators, Martine, Gareth, and Ophelia, worked together to document autumn communities that were on both sides of the U.S. border, so living in Sonora, Mexico, and living in Southern Arizona. And so this is really telling the story of communities who were living in the Sonoran side of the border and how they were distanced and cut off from their relatives here. Um, so some of the artists have, that we're including, we're like Ruben has a history of family being on both sides of the border, and then the photographs are showing um, that region along the side. I'm going to share the screen so you guys can see an example of um, 
how things look, maybe. So here you can see um, a QR code which presents Ophelia's poetry. You can listen to it and hear her voice. Um, if you have an extra device with you, you can take a picture of that QR code and come back to it later. And how it's paired with one of the photographs of an organ pipe cactus in the Mexico side. Um, so there are a lot of, it's super interdisciplinary. You can hear things when you're in this space. You can look at ceramics, photographs, read the poetry, um, and really experience this kind of, this landscape in, in multiple ways. Okay. That's stunning. I'm gonna share. So here you can see Ruben's ceramics piece and he's got these figures painted on them. You can read the label. Um, and then you get an idea kind of about how that piece is grounded within the exhibition. And then uh, Amberly Ortega's, her poetry and photographs are also involved um, and she identifies more as an activist than a poet or a photographer. Um, but these, again, were pieces that we added in to the exhibition in addition to the photographs and poetry by Ophelia because we felt like it was really important to include more voices. Um, and so you get these kind of new perspectives. Absolutely. And so we actually, we integrated our, per our permanent collection. You can't see it from where we are in right a second. now. But um, we have it as a part of this whole story, going back to that theme of stories. And so um, part of the reason this exhibition ended up being delayed and we didn't open it until February was because there are a lot of people in the photograph and we wanted to make sure we had the support of the traditional Otham leadership in Sonora before we put those photographs on view. And having the works from uh, Ruben and Amber were really crucial to making this work. So we delayed the opening in order to kind of honor those relationships and make sure we were really um, including that perspective and voice. And Mariana, you said that this is just one example, or this was a pilot project for yeah. um, commu what community-based curation will look like at the Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have a few more slides to share, but I'd love to hear more about um, how the museum plans to incorporate um, this type of curation in future exhibits. Yep, I'll just, um, here's one last image, and they're all on view. They will be on view when we reopen at the end of the month, so you can come in and check those out, and I think we can send the PowerPoints um, so you guys can check that out as well after. Yeah, we'll be sure to send way so you could see. So um, in October, November of this past year, we were awarded a national leadership grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, and that entire project, it's a three-year project, is dedicated to developing uh, community-based curation strategies and working with our permanent collection. So since we're positioned in a permanent ga gallery spaces, I'm going to kind of just pivot a little so you can see over, so you can see this intro text here, but then there's a painting that is part of our permanent collection. And Christine's trying to help me not trip. I appreciate that. Um, so we are really in conversation with this permanent collection space, uh, trying to think about new strategies to bring in diverse perspectives. So this is our first kind of pilot run. And then in March of 2021, we'll be uh, installing an entire new display of our Indigenous Arts Gallery. Um, and Christine can talk a little bit about that, but that'll be kind of our next phase. We have a lot of different strategies for what community-based curation looks like. That'll be shared on our website so other museums can tap into the knowledge that we're finding. Um, but we're gonna pilot and put into action all of those in March of 2021. 21. Do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. <laughs> With a deep breath, right? Um, because it is, a, it is a large project. Um, and, and it's a work in progress. It's a work in project. It's an exciting project. Um, it's, it's where we should be going as an institution. It's looking at our collection and how it integrates with the way we work with our communities. Yeah. And so um, over the past few months, I've, I've been evaluating what our collection has, the Native um, collection, 
Um, we've been working with uh, cultural centers. We've been and having lots of meetings, going to cells, going to these different areas and meeting with people. And I mean, that's really where Mariana comes in as the curator of community engagement, where we have to make these connections in order to bring these voices forward. And so it's more than me looking at the collection and coming with, up with an exhibition that's out of my comfort zone as a curator, because that's what I've been taught to do. Um, but when you include these other voices, it becomes something amazing. It becomes something really relevant and something that people want to come and see. And all the themes that we're kind of organizing the exhibition by right now have been determined through these conversations, which have been going on for, again, probably about a year. Yeah, um, or and, longer. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think back. Um, and we've been going to meetings monthly, sometimes twice a week, sometimes um, I was at Baba Kibri High School, I feel like twice in one week there, there was a moment. Um, but really trying to talk about like what our collection is, what the museum is, and what would be relevant to the different communities and artists, indigenous artists that we collaborate with. So we have a bunch of themes yes. that have been determined collectively. So we've kind of like culled those together. And now Christine is trying to put together artworks in those themes. Yes. And we are planning to work with, I think there'll be eight authors of text within that space. Um, so contemporary indigenous artists speaking about works in our collection, um, the cultural council, a committee representative from the San Javier district of the Donna Autumn community will be working with us. We have two loans that I'm pretty excited about working with contemporary uh, Tana Autumn potters. Um, one of the things we learned is that we don't have a large collection of Tana Autumn works. So how do we augment that through loans and through different collaborations is really crucial. Exactly, exactly. So it's been a process and you know, we have to hit the ground running on it um, where, where we look at where we have gaps in the collection we reach out to the community. Yep. Uh, it's been really fun to have the conversations and that's my favorite part, right? I look at curation as a as collaboration and as dialogue. Um, so maybe I'm, I'm a little more comfortable with it, but I would say you're pretty good at it these days. Oh, thanks. Yeah, she's got it down. <laughs> really hard. Um, yeah. And so the big question for this grant that we have of is how do or can museums reflect and integrate local communities within the museum? And so really for us, we're gonna look at that indigenous community first um, because it's overwhelming to tackle all of your collection areas at once. Uh, so we're gonna do it small and with intention and then move to different areas as we go on. That is really exciting. Um, I love just the, the collaboration and um, excited to see what, what becomes of that. Um, we do have a question Yay. Um, related to the discussion, but I do want to say um, that it is 5.58, just to give you a yep. sense of time, because I know that we will be moving on to our activity in a little bit. Um, the question is, do the community participants select the art or provide feedback before and during the selection process? And if they do select, do you give them a menu of options? So what, I mean, and Christine can speak to this a little now, now this is where we're at in that process, um, actually. So we are putting together a checklist that'll go out to our key collaborators on this project. Um, and they will have the opportunity then to put in input and kind of give us advice on the selections that we've made, um, but also give recommendations on the themes that have been identified. Right. Knowing that our collection is what it is, sort of. So, like, how many works do we of right. this art do we have? We have roughly 400 works, and so that obviously doesn't include everyone and every type of object. And so, when we reach out to these collaborators and show them our checklists, they may say, "Oh, you know what? This may be really important for you to include." And so. I go back and I evaluate what to do next. If this is something that we can have alone. Then I start making phone calls. That <laughs> too. <laughs> because that, you know, it's, it's, it's this ongoing process. You can't just simply pick a piece and move on. It's, it's going back and forth. Yep. It's, you know. It's very cyclical. Yeah. And, and, um, 
having that final say is something that this type of model doesn't really allow. Yeah. It's more, like she said, cyclical and it goes back and forth. And we know that we'll, we'll install this and we'll do the work and we'll have it ready for March, 2021. But the reality is, is we'll make edits and revisions along the way. Um, and that's, that's okay. Uh, we want to be able well, to be flexible uh, with the community and with the kind of stories we're telling. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's that flexibility in these situations are crucial. <laughs> so if there are other Absolutely. questions, we can take those, but I'm going to move us through so we can move to the next area. I don't know how I'm going to do this. We're just going to get a little tour. And this exhibit went up in mid-February, is that correct? February 9th. Febru February 9th, okay. So um, it was up for a few weeks before the closure. So yep. many people may not have had the chance to experience it just yet. No, it's true. So, and we've extended it. Um, so it'll be on view probably until we move um, to the new space when it happens. Sorry, I'm moving really slow. Well, oh, this is nice. I'm too dizzy. I don't want to trip. <laughs> see all my stuff in the corner. Yeah, we'll pretend like you guys didn't see that. <laughs> now everyone's saying, what? What did I miss? We, we didn't see it. <laughs> okay, good. I tried to move really fast. And I saw Anne and Russell run out of the room too. So we have a security guard with us here this evening who's helping to make this happen and Anne Thwaites. Uh, so they are here supporting us. Right, just a couple people who are behind the scenes with us this evening, but they ran away. <laughs> They're out of frame. Yeah, no uh, I don't want to distract you from the very important task of navigating space <laughs> with valuable art delicately. Um, someone did ask a, a question related to the pandemic um, and what of challenges it has presented you and how you're overcoming them. If you want to give a couple of quick uh quick thoughts before we spend some time with mm -hmm. oh man museum. how we've been overcoming well you know we're getting better at working from home um that is a struggle for me i'm not great at that um i like to be in the office uh thinking creatively about programming i'm really excited that this week for the first time we're going to launch a digital first thursday um, so we haven't done it since like April. And this is one of the first. I know, this is our first time. So, so we're hoping we can. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> You're our guinea pigs. We really have <laughs> coming along on this journey with us. Um, so we are kind of thinking about what it means to still stay connected and offer grams. Um, and you'll be seeing more, um, is there the truth. We have some kind of like small snippets of digital content. Christine has developed yes. this series called Cookies with the Curator, and there's still one more to get launched, right? That's right. Yeah. So we each are creating these new digital um, things that are coming out, whether it's interviews, like what I'm doing with Cookies with the Curator, where I'm interviewing artists that are in our collection. Um, we also have, you know, all kinds of things that we're working on. A book on. club for our book members, club. I know. Yeah. Um, we'll do, like I said, we're going to do First Thursday this month digitally. We partnered with Hawkins Dance, who's our, one of our long-term collaborators. Um, so we'll use it as an opportunity to do a throwback to an old exhibition, but also feature kind of their, their dance films, the Mood Room series. Mm. Um, yeah, so we're not stopping. We're, we're yeah. Gonna, but we're pivoting because of this pandemic. We're going to so keep the public engaged. There's still lots of ways to connect with the museum, even if we can't physically be there yes. just yet. Yeah, yeah exactly. and our social media is active. If you're not on our e-news, which I'm sure most of you are, because I know one of you are our members, so I appreciate you guys for looking out for those emails when they come. Um, it's a great way to stay informed. We've been launching a lot of content through that. Um, well, I am just dying to hear more about this incredible piece behind you. It is uh, speaking to me um, as we await kind of the first monsoon of the season. Um, so tell us what this piece is and what we will be doing. All right. So Christine, are you comfortable giving us a brief intro to our Western Art Gallery and collection first? 
oh, not sure. about this piece though yet. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Where we are standing now, um, this piece is, is located. I can do a little. Is thing. in our Frank and Jean Hamilton Gallery, which is um, where we house our Art of the American West um, exhibition. So we have, um, just like the Indigenous Arts Gallery, we have a range of dates um, and media climb. that our collection includes. So it's sculpture, like you can see this Ed Mel piece. Unfortunately, you see them from the backside. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> we have paintings, we have other bronzes. We have works on paper here. And the theme is the West. So it's landscapes, it's cowboys, it's all kinds of Westerners. So it's a great collection. Again, I'm not biased. Lies. Not at all. <laughs> She's definitely biased. Um, but it's okay, we, we love her for it. Okay. So in a second, I'll let you talk about this piece, but I first am going to do another screen share and then ask people to think about the work a little bit. Oops, maybe. Now you're going to see all my contacts come up. Okay, so we are looking at this painting. It's fairly large scale. Like if I was to stand in front of it and have my arms out, um, I think it's probably about my height. I can tell you specifically, right, in theory, because I have a caption down there. So it's 42 by 60 inches, so it's a little, it would be a little longer than my arm span. That's right. Um, but because we're all anxiously awaiting monsoon season, I want you to think about this, this landscape and try to imagine yourself within it. Have you ever seen or been in a moment like this? Note the deep colors, the rich earth, roll those rolling in thunder clouds, and that reprieve from dryness we're all waiting for. So this is where I want you to use that chat function. So if you've got it up and ready to go, I'm gonna try to, I can't pull it up while I'm screen sharing, so I can't participate either. But so pull up your chat uh, function, and we're gonna collaboratively make a list. Uh, trying to think about the smells that we might have if we're in that space. What does the rain smell like? The sounds, what might those clouds sound like? Or perhaps those, those bushes down in the foreground and the colors we're seeing. So just anyone, um, you know, just write one word, two word functions. Veronica, are we getting any responses? Yes, she shakes her yes, head. Yes, Creaso, of course, is the first uh, reaction. The low rumble of thunder in the distance. Nice. I can feel my skin reconstituting. I love that. Thanks. Grumbly thunder, rumbling. So where and when might this scene take place? Again, use that chat function and share what you're thinking about. Um, and then look closely at the foreground, middle ground, and background. What details can you find? Uh, and then share those details in the chat. We really want to build a collective knowledge while we're talking about this piece. So build thinking about creoso, what happens in those moments? Um, what about those clouds? Their skin reconstituting, give us details about that. Work together to think about how those ideas are connected. Um, if you're comfortable sharing something about it, tell us about that. I remember a monsoon um, where my mom was trying to leave to go back to New York uh, and it was raining so much that like it was flooding everywhere and she was very stressed she was going to miss her airplane. So some th sometimes images can kind of evoke memories. Right. Yeah, my daughter was born in one of the biggest monsoons we had that year and I just think of like how appropriate, right? Like renewal and yeah. um, growth and rebirth really. Um, we have some renewals. A lot of people are, are talking about the feeling, so that yep. the excitement, the anticipation, the fear. Great. Yeah, sometimes those things can be scary. My dogs hate thunder. Anytime a really loud thunder, they'll like kind of scoot across the house and like hide in a corner. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to ask, now that we've kind of have our ideas going and we've shared those perspectives, I'm going to ask Christine to give us a little more information on this piece, and hopefully not too much, because we still have more to do. Sure. Here I am. 
around, get back in there. Again. Do you want me to go back to you? I was keeping the image up. Oh, you're good. Um, I can. Well, going. there's not much to say about um, the piece itself because I do not know where it is located. Perfect. I like it. So let's just say it's Southwest. Um, the artist, his name is Lawrence, Lawrence Sisson. And this piece actually was donated by his wife, which was a really nice gift after he had passed away. Uh, it's called Thunder, Thundering Desert. So you can tell that he is inspired by the Southwest. He used to go back and forth between the Southwest and Maine, believe it or not. And so- We call it a snowbird, right? I, I suppose so. <laughs> And so he's known for the paintings of both locations. And I can only imagine the difference that you would, you would feel or the paint palette or anything like that as an artist going back and forth between those two. Drastically different yeah. landscapes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's nice to know that he was willing to do that, to kind of expand himself. Um, and so he actually he spent a lot of time in Japan and that influenced some of his work. I don't think there's a lot of influence in this piece, but that was a, a big part of his life. Um, and so he's just known for these rich tones, these colors, and just how you know he brought the desert to life, really. Um, if you have time, Google it. <laughs> You know, it's not a bad She's thing. giving you an assignment. She's like a teacher. Yeah. Is most of his work um, landscapes, Christine? Yes, he is known as a landscape painter. Yeah. Uh, I remember when this work went on view, and it wasn't that long ago, um, but I was like coming down here to check something out, and it stopped me in my tracks. Um, I, I don't know, it was like maybe those like red rich colors and there's this like texture in the ground. This, yeah. That is like amazing. Um, and it feels really good to kind of stand there and look at it. And I think that's a big thing when you go to a museum or anywhere. Um, museums are better though. But museums are better. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you take time to look at pieces because I, I've heard somewhere and you can correct me isn't it 17 seconds maybe less or less yeah people stop to look at works of art and I think that maybe we should change that I think yeah, maybe looking longer look longer and see things that maybe you haven't seen before so I'm gonna Oops. move on to kind of are, are there another questions um no just we have uh people continuing to share yeah. awesome. um, their, their thoughts upon seeing this piece. Okay, so I'm gonna try to look at that chat also so I can see it. Um, but what we're gonna do now is, I want you to, now that we've made all this information together, right, we have collective knowledge, Christine shared us some insights. Now this is where you're gonna need that pencil and paper. Um, I want you to write your own three line poem and I'm going to give you the three, the way, the way I want you to start it because the goal is that once we combine these all together and because we have such a big group, if everybody participates, it'll probably just be one line from everybody. Um, <laughs> but we'll put it as a community voices label here. So we have this document of the evening together. So your first line starts with the word rolling. So take that pen and paper, looking at the work, rolling is the first word for you to use. Should we put the image back up? I don't know, do I have? I'm gonna change it quickly. Okay, and I know some people might still be working, but rolling, and then your next sentence will start with, it was. And then your third sentence will start with, it felt. And so take some time and write these out yourself. 
I'm going to screen share in one second so you can see the work and the prompts. And then we, if you're comfortable um, sharing that, please do so in the chat, your three line poem. Oh, I lost it. Um, I know, hold on, we'll go back, there we go. So again, that first line rolling, your second line it was, and your third line it felt. So again, if you're having trouble thinking of ideas, go back and look at that chat and see what everybody else kind of was sharing together. Um, when we do activities like this, I really like to build a collective knowledge before I throw you into kind of activities like this. Very literal. She's gonna throw this you into the activity. <laughs> I am a New Yorker and I'm very loud, so it's possible I could throw you into the activity. <laughs> This activity is just tapping into all of our senses here when we yes. experience this work. Yeah. We have some great three-line poems that are coming in. Are you comfortable to read them as they come in, Veronica? Sure. Uh, Bobby shares, I was rolling through the trails. It was the first day of the monsoon. It felt spiritual loping through it on my mare. Uh, Cammie shares, it was late, maybe too late. It felt <laughs> majestic and lonely. Right. Deborah shares, rolling clouds, rolling deep thunder. Elle shares, rolling in from the heavens. Great. Judy, rolling density. It was late day. It felt vast and heavy. Amazing. I like it. I know. It was big, furious, and swift. <laughs> and always too short sometimes. <laughs> uh, Definitely. Ro rolling tumultuous thunder was reaching me to my core. It felt like a spirit was released from my body. These are all just different submissions and they're already creating a very yep. cohesive poem. I'm excited about <laughs> like just the way you've read them. They kind of just sound amazing all together. Maybe we should have her narrate. I know. Oh yeah, you can, Ronick, maybe you'll record this for us and we can stick it as a little cute. I know. Do I, do I have a future as a, I think a so. poem uh, audio, audio reader? Uh, let's see. Rolling into the sky, the rain clouds suggest hope for a downpour. It was a relief to know that the monsoons would finally come. It felt hopeful, renewing. This is making me emotional. I know, this. I was thinking the same thing. I just made like a little like sigh noise. Yeah. It was powerful and peaceful. It felt exhilarating and enlivening. Yay. These are great. I know, I love them. I'm so thankful that you guys are willing to share these with us. Um, I, but you know, maybe that chat function is like really empowering. You don't have to sit, get up and say it. That's true. Just be a little anonymous, just a little. Just share your thoughts. I love um, just seeing the um, common themes that are emerging and then just the different, you know, the differences um, in the interpretation as well. Yeah. Um, I think it, it really builds a lot of community in this, this type of environment. It does. And so Christine and I have been piloting these or experimenting with them. I don't even know the right word. The, the yeah. idea of community voices labels since 2013. I can't believe it's been. I know. <laughs> it's like a real long time. <laughs> Who have you been working with on these projects? Mariana. So uh, in the beginning, we started working with one of our collaborators, Alan Panther. So it was working with refugee youth in the galleries um, and trying to really think about how you could change who was speaking about works. Um, and then we did a lot of them with the, what was that show called? Western Heroes of Pulp Fiction. Yes. So we were talking about that exhibition and I remember asking Christine, well, the, the Western hero looks pretty, pretty white. And I was like, what are you going to do about that? And she just looked at me and was Great like, what question. are you going to do about that? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> it was like, one of so those what moments. did you do? <laughs> well, we ended up working together to come up with these, again, we did community voices labels for the exhibition 
um, and invited different uh, academic scholars or communities. We did a couple of collaborative activities. It was a wide range. We had like people. 12 or 13 yeah. in that show, and it was a wide age range. We had a mm -hmm. sixth grader. Um, yeah, we've had all kinds of participants. For another yeah. show we did um, called The New Westward, we had a math teacher submit something. We yeah, had steam. A, it's steam. Yes, because that one we focused more on steam, not STEM, steam. <laughs> Um, and so this has been building. Um, yeah. You and I have done this with several shows. And so it's one of the strategies that we're kind of talking about in reference to this idea of community-based curation. So how can you insert more expertise? And for us, community voices have been a good solution and fun. Yeah. And what do you find um, in the, the differences and similarities between the way an expert and a curator might label a piece and the way that a community member has chosen to interpret the piece? That's a really good question. Well, so I am a firm believer that everybody is an expert in their own experience, right? So you bring a knowledge bank to an artwork and that is incredibly relevant and important. It totally frames how you're experiencing the work. And part of this grant that we have and the project that we're looking at is really about being culturally responsive. And so it's about that connection to, to being relevant to the specific person looking at it. Um, but I actually probably enjoy reading labels from not a museum expert more than traditional labels. Blasphemy. I know I said it. <laughs> Uh oh, I did it's a it. good thing you're. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. I guess so. I grew up going to museums. I'm like a museum nerd. I got like a background in art history. I did all those studies. Um, got a PhD in museum studies or in art education. But I love seeing something or hearing something I didn't expect. Right? So like when I go up in the label and someone's telling me about the artist, I kind of expected to learn that. Um, I really want, like, you know, when Veronica, you were reading those, the, the comments and the poems that everybody wrote, like I want that this emotional reaction when I see a work. And having those community voices really brings that to a new level. Right. And, you know, as a curator. I didn't, I love you. <laughs> there, there are certain ways of looking at label development. Um, at TMA, the curator has written the content for the labels. It goes through a vetting process through uh, Mariana um, to make sure that we have everything that, you know, is at a certain reading level and that we're not kind of going off the deep end a little bit with a large word or something very scholarly. Um, mm -hmm. But that's one voice. And so we're looking to expand that one voice and that one area that a curator is presenting. Um, so, you know, there's that traditional way and then there's this way that... And I think there's room for that, <laughs> right? Like, I think yeah. it's really important to have them in conversation together. Absolutely. Um, to both ground it in kind of the historical information that like maybe Christine is going to share and really then something else too, right? Bringing in these new, new, new expertise or different. Yeah. Things. Right. Oh, it's completely, I mean, it's, it's valid <laughs> in each. Yeah, year. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So. I just love that that you frame it in that way, just sort of like honoring each person's experience um, and, and how that lends itself to the way that they experience these works. Um, we have some amazing submissions that are still coming in, uh, Mariana, and I just wanted to do another time check. It's 624. Um, if there is any other part of this activity, um, I don't want to to so delay that with my questions. We are going to share well, this chat we get to hold on to, right? Like, so I don't mm -hmm. have to worry about losing these. Um, no. Because we are planning, like I said, to create a label. Um, you can, if you want to think about it and choose your favorite line, um, email it to me. Um, and maybe we can follow up with my email. I don't know what's the easiest way for that. I'm going to put the email in the okay, chat great. right great. this second. 
So email me, but we're also gonna have access. We are recording this, so we're gonna have the responses um, and we are planning to create a label. So hopefully, I'm really excited just to see kind of how it emerges. It might have to be a digital label. I'm thinking like a QR code now. Oh, it might, yeah. Because there's so many these like are, amazing things. These are great. Hi, Julie. I'm gonna just give like little shout outs as I read. Oh, all of these, like one Julie is there. It's so excited. <laughs> I know. I mean, oh, it's fine. it's so exciting. We we get to uh, see the work of art, but we actually get to see art being created right here in this space together. Yeah. So I'm so excited to see the final product. I did share Mariana's okay. email address in Great. the chat. So if there is one line that you're really passionate about that you wrote and you thought like, this is my best work, send that one to me um, because the reason I gave everybody the same first prompts so rolling it was it felt was that it could become a multi-line poem but that each stanza so those three line groupings could be the same and it would repeat um, and I, I did that because I felt like when it rains there's like a rhythm to, to artwork right there, there's a rhythm to artwork but there's a rhythm to the rain and so I figured we might as well try to experiment with like a rhythmic poem also yeah so a little background to my putting this activity together process. yeah yeah that makes sense um we have just a couple minutes if anyone has any um last minute questions that they want to ask i know there was a question that came in a little bit earlier as you were introducing the piece um, about the medium and what the difference is between painting on masconite you guys said that right Masconite versus tonight. canvas it's a text Say it one more time masonite masonite, masonite. yeah it's a textural thing. Masonite is very flat, smooth, smooth. <laughs> um, and so the grip um, of the paint on masonite is a little bit different than canvas because canvas has the ability to kind of absorb it, take it in a little bit. Um, and so I think that flatter approach on the on the smoothness of the masonite um, kind of almost like keeps the 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 color from going in and you kind of lose it. So it's keeping it bright. It yeah. also must be incredibly difficult, right? Because masonite is a smooth surface yes. and oils take a really long time to dry. So you imagine that you could like ruin it uh, in yes. a way you couldn't maybe when it was absorbing into the canvas. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes on these flat surfaces over time, it may peel off, which don't worry. We'll keep an eye on it. You're here. taking care of it. <laughs> but <laughs> that can happen if the, if the um, piece hasn't been primed properly. So, you know, it's just a different surface. Yeah. Interesting. Um, we have someone who wants to know if this print will be available for sale in the gift shop at any point. Oh, good question. Print of this. Um, it is a painting, but, um, you know, maybe... <laughs> In the future, we can look into having a postcard or something like that in the shop. Do we have the rights to do that with an image, this one? Well, I have to look into it um, because we, we do everything above board and make sure <laughs> we get the rights and licensing to reproduce something. Um, and every and artist has different kind of rights and reproduction limitations or permissions. And yeah. so... For example, with this work, we would have to check in with the, I guess the widow, right? I think so. Yep. I think so. The wife. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Other questions? I don't see any. Um, so someone asked what happens if an artist has passed away? Um, and you, you addressed that. It would be whoever is sort of in charge of the, yep. the, the estate. The collection and the estate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there are these large um, agencies that take care of rights of certain estates and we go through them a lot if it's a very well-known name. So yeah, it just depends. I'm going to just share Mariana's email address one more time as we are about to wrap up. Um, no spam. Pagno at Tucson Museum of Art dot work. No hate mail. Yeah, love notes only no mail. Got it. 
Um, and then uh, Becky, one of my colleagues, also shared our website. This is Yay. Tucson.com, where you can um, follow our stories. And of course, the Tucson Museum of Art website is also in the chat. Um, I, I just want to say thank you so much, Christine and Mariana, for this um, really incredible experience and allowing us to to visit a space that I know many of us are missing right now mm -hmm. um, and sharing a bit more about um, your process. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're so happy to, to see so many people here tonight. Um, so we are so excited to see you at the next one, hopefully. Yeah. We're getting thank lots of thank yous in the chat, lots Yay. of people. Are so happy. Great. Lots of things. It's always hard to like end the chat because I'm like, oh, I'm the, I'm the type of person that's like, one more hug, one more goodbye. Right. That's how I feel too. I was like, I'll just stay here <laughs> for a while. I know, I know. <laughs> you go so fast. Uh, to some Museum of Art Rocks. Thank you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, and hopefully again, we can partner again with This is Tucson. And stay tuned for more programming from TMA in the near future. Yeah, we already had some conversations about what the next one might look like. Yes. So let me stay know. Stay tuned. Yes. Thanks. All right. Good night, everyone. Have Thank a great you so evening. much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.